Recording? That's good. Um, what I thought we'd do tonight uh, is just answer questions for you if you wanted to have uh, some questions answered. Um, who has not been along to one of the seminars before? Wow. Jeez. Oh, all right, so a good half of the audience. All right. Um, what have you already seen, those of you who have not been along? Have you already seen a DVD, like a Secrets of the Universe DVD? All of those kind of things. So you've got a bit of background about what I've been teaching different people, so that's very good. Those of you, do all of you know the website where you can download audio files from? Uh, nobody, uh, you want me to write some, write that down? I'll write that down. So the website is www.divinetruth.com and on that website you'll find some audio files. An audio recording of every session generally is done and so you can download the audio files. They're quite large files. There's also one called .com.au which is exactly the same look and feel as the .com one. So if you can't get onto the .com site, you can get onto the .com.au site. Um, also on that site is any mediumship that's been done by people on the Divine Love Path um, who've asked us to post that mediumship on the site. So sometimes there's also MP3 recordings of mediumship that's been done uh, in particular to help spirits. And one thing that we've been doing recently is uh, it, most Sundays when we're in Butterham, we've actually been doing a session where we help spirits uh, work through their particular emotional issues. And you'll find that there's some very interesting material that's presented to those spirits and very interesting backgrounds that they have that will actually connect in some way generally to your own life. So you might be quite fascinated in that. that that's under the section uh, Contemporary Messages, it's called. Contemporary, my spelling is not always that good. Uh, is that how you spell it? Messages. And uh, and sometimes they are transcripted material, in other words, typewritten material that you have to read, and other ones are MP3 recordings that you can actually download and listen to on your computer. And the actual seminar material is under seminars, under seminar downloads, under anywhere under seminars you'll find uh, the download section there. So that's a bit of background for you. When you walk away, you've got somewhere to go to. Yes. Can we have it into the mic? How are you doing? Good, thank you. Just wanted to know about the DVDs. What's what, happening with those? What's happening at the moment is we're just in the process of changing things around. The whole lot is being done voluntarily by people. And what we're doing is we have a, a, a couple of people who are doing the transference of the video recorded information that gets video recorded here um, and they put it onto a DVD master and then we have a group of people, there's, there's two DVD towers that we've recently purchased and there's a group of people just punching out DVD after DVD after DVD. Now what's happening is we've yet to really fully got it fully operational so we're producing only a couple of hundred DVDs a week at this point. Um, but we're capable of producing about 5,000 DVDs to 10,000 DVDs a month. Um, and what we want to do is give them all out for free. But of course that's very dependent upon donations we receive. The DVDs cost us around about a dollar or so to actually produce. And so what we're trying to do is get them to, the, to be, be able to be given out at sessions like this. So in future what we're hoping to do is bring along with us whole boxes of DVDs of all the different sessions. We leave them up the back somewhere and then anybody who wants to can just go along and pick up those DVDs. They're all able to be copied, they're, they're not copyrighted, but it's just taking a little bit of time to get that operational, uh, time that uh, I've had to spend that I haven't spent yet, and also time in the sense of getting a sort of a, a, a supply sorted out as well. So far we've uh, spent about five or $6,000 on DVDs themselves, but we're still, that, that just goes every weekend at Butterham unfortunately. And so in, in the end what we need to do is just get a supply up so that we can give them out at these seminars. So at the moment you can also um, order the DVDs over the net, um, but that too is also just in its infancy stages, so there's 
some teething issues we've got to sort out with that as well. So at the moment, there's a bit of a dry supply of DVDs, aside from the people who are locally who can copy them for you. Yeah, I think it's yeah. just the, the ones for the last so many months. Mm-hmm. I've got most of them up until, I think, September last year, but there doesn't seem to be many available from Peter to purchase. No, um, Peter is not uh, doing the DVDs anymore because wh- what he was doing was out of his own pocket, he was actually going to a fellow who wasn't on the Divine Love path to actually produce the DVDs and he was spending quite a lot of money doing that. And what we wanted to do is just have the whole thing run by donation. So so we've had to swap things around a fair bit and uh, in the end, D- Peter will have DVDs you can still order but they won't be ones that you'll buy uh, like they have in the past. So you just order them, and if you want to give a donation, you can, but if you don't want to, you don't have to. And ho- what we want to do is just use as many of the donations we receive into getting those DVDs out. But uh, what I wanted to do was to bring it all into harmony with the way God works uh, and 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 the way I work as well, which is to do everything by everything for free. And uh, and it wasn't happening like that. And I felt at the time that that was severely limiting the distribution of truth. So what we want to do is get it get it down to a different way of operation, but but that's taking a bit of time to sort out. And and remembering that everyone involved is actually doing it by donation themselves. So they're donating their own time and their own effort. And many of them don't have any funds of their own. And so um, a lot of things are being given in order for it to happen. It, it'll take, I feel, another month to two months before everything's righted with it and you'll start getting a flow of the DVDs of what's been happening over the last, uh, since September. Um, remember, though, that the MP3s are always on the net, so um, aside from last month, which I've just put on yesterday, um, the MP3s are always on the net generally within a day or two after the seminar, so that they're always available to listen to. But I realise sometimes it's a lot easier when you've got some action to look at as well and a board to look at. Um, there's quite a lot of things actually happening um, as well where people are, are um, getting the Book of Truths, which is the Paget messages, and translating them into different uh, languages now. And there's a team of people who are working in the Gold Coast uh, doing that. And I'd, they want to present those for free as well, and eventually we'll have the PDF documents of all of those available on the website as well. And there's also all of the discussions that I've presented are all being turned into transcripted documents that a person can actually read in book form. And uh, that's taking quite a lot of time, of course, And uh, but that's happening, and eventually they'll be being placed on the internet as well. So... There's more and more resources available. But what we're trying to do is get these discussions with you on the net straight away and also the discussions with the, uh, the with the spirits on the net straight away because they're the things that have a lot of power in terms of your own progression. Yep. Is there any other questions along those lines before I get started? You want to ask one? Come on, then we'll go over here. It's available here lately? Sure. Uh, right. Um, at this back desk, we've got some takeaway slips, and the, they have the email uh, for for local activities if you'd like to find out about our groups, and also it has the official divinetruth.com website on it, and um, we have a donation box for H A and Mary's uh, living expenses. All these talks are free, and they do very kindly donate all of their time freely. So that's if you want it, and we did have um, an email list here where you can put your name and address and phone number emails. I think someone started to pass it around. So we do have quite active local groups if you'd like to be involved. Um, on that point, obviously the local group is, um, is is trying to just practice the principles that they're learning on the Divine Love Path and practice the different processing emotionally and things like that. Obviously, um, when Mary comes down and does the workshop with you, if you want to do the workshop, um, you'll see what we recommend to do uh, with regard to emotional processing and so forth in that workshop. So um, you'll benefit a lot from the workshop. By the way, the workshops are also for free. Um, and, uh, and sometimes Mary has a little team 
who travels with her. Um, I don't know if we will when we come down here. I'm, I might be her assistant instead. Um, but uh, um, so that that's something to bear in mind as well with all of these things. We just respond to the demand of people in different locations. That's basically what we do. Perhaps if on that email list that Karina has started, if people wouldn't mind um, it, just starting a little list with their email address if they're interested in doing an opening to God here in Coffs, that way I can just email that list. Does that sound okay? Yep. Was that really clear? <laughs> um, what Mary meant is that if you are interested in coming to the Opening to God workshop, which is the workshop that Mary is doing and its title, then, then if you can indicate that on the email list, and then we can email you when we'll be doing that. Now, j well, yeah, or something like that, yeah, yeah. or a, or a workshop, please, or something. <laughs> and microphone, please, if we can have a microphone over uh, the the lady in white first, if we can go. Sorry, the lady in white first, and then and then down. Yep. It takes about four seconds to warm up. So. Hello. Uh, yes, I uh, heard about this event at, at very late notice. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know if it's appropriate right now to ask this, but I just wanted to know um, personally who you are. Yep. And... Uh, on what basis is your claim to having the truth? Um, well, personally, I, my name um, is Alan John Miller and um, I'm also Jesus, the person that you would know of from the first century and I've had a 2,000-year existence. Um, and in terms of the claim about the truth, well, uh, the, the things that I'm teaching you are the things that I've learnt over that period of time. That's all. How do you know you're Jesus? Well, um, how do you know what's your name? What's your name? That's irrelevant. We're no. talking about you. No, but what's your name? X. <laughs> but can you see how already you don't want to be honest with me and open with me? Can you see that? No, I, I want you to answer the question. Oh, I'm going to you answer your question. I'm going to answer your question, but already you can see that you're coming from a very closed perspective, because you won't even tell me your name, and I've just told you mine. We can't even have okay, Xanthi. Xanthi. Yes. Well, Xanthi, you have a series of memories about your life, do you not? Is that correct? Intermittent ones. Intermittent ones. Yeah, because so there's some memories that you lose over time, obviously. You know, you forget about, you know, what you ate this day five years ago and things like that. But there are obviously other memories that you have that are quite firmly fixed inside of yourself. And those memories are often quite present with you all of your life. And sometimes it's through traumatic events that you remember and other times it's through traumatic events that you try to forget. And then there's also a series of uh, events in your life that, you know, perhaps that were joyful at the time that you remember, like when you got married perhaps. Some, for some people that wasn't so joyful perhaps, but, but for many people they have these series of memories about their life. Well, what I'm saying to you is I have a series of memories about my life that began 2,000 years ago up until this point. Where have you been for 2,000 years? Um, well, obviously the first 30 so years of my life I spent in the first century. And, and then when I passed, I passed into the 10th dimension of the spirit world. And then as I progressed further spiritually, I progressed through these different dimensions. And as I progressed, they got created until myself and my soulmate uh, unified in the 22nd dimension of the spirit world. And then we decided to return back to earth here. So th that's where we've been for the last 2,000 years. Um, and one of my primary roles in that period of time has been to teach the truth that I've personally learnt to others. And there are many, many people now who are in the celest what I call the celestial heavens of the spirit world, which are the dimensions from the eighth sphere to the 22nd sphere of the spirit world. And, and seven of those complete souls, which are 14 people, decided to return back to earth to teach those truths. 
and uh, and are still in the process of of doing it themselves, of working through the things themselves. And as they develop that, then they'll get to a stage where they'll be able to teach you far more already than what I'm teaching you already. Do you remember being Jewish? Yes, certainly. I don't remember. There's a lot I don't remember still. Um, for example, I can't speak the language I spoke 2,000 years ago. Um, I can't uh, remember many scientific things that I have learnt that I know uh, is inside of me that I'm still blocked to remembering. But I remember most of the events. Um, in fact, I can speak at uh, for many, many hours if you wanted me to. I don't think you'd. I think you'd be bored by it. But I can speak for many, many hours about my life in the first century and what happened all the way through my life in the first century, and uh, not what you would read in the Bible, um, though some of it is accurate. Um, and also I, my, I can describe the meeting of my soulmate in the first century because we did meet on earth in the first century and I was actually married as well. How do you account for all the crimes done in your name? Well, um, the answer to that is quite simple in that any crime done in my name is not, is, although they have a claim of it done in my name, um, it's not in my name because I've only ever taught peace and love and I've never taught violence. And in fact, if you look at the record of my life that you can even read in the Bible to a degree, you will see that I never promoted any violence of any sort. And so any crime that's done in my name is certainly not done in my name. And in fact, there's a verse in the Bible um, that I actually did say where I said that uh, many people would come to me saying, did we not do these things in your name? Why aren't you our friend? You know, the way the Bible says it is, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not expel demons in your name? Did we not do all of these things in your name? And that I will say to them, get away from me, you workers of lawlessness, because you do not know me. And the truth is that the majority of people who claim to do things in my name today don't know me. And they've never really known me, actually. And so, so the, the thing that one of the reasons why myself and Mary wanted to return back to earth was to correct a lot of these untruths that are, that are present in the, in the world today. And a lot of these untruths are present about Firstly, about myself and my life. Secondly, about Mary and, and our life together. But thirdly, about the truths of the universe that I taught in the first century that were also lost. And many of those truths, unfortunately, um, have, have been distorted beyond belief. And, uh, and what we would like to do is obviously correct that you know, as a part of this process. But the problem is there are so many untruths that have been taught in my name that, that I could go on for weeks and weeks and weeks about every one of them and you'd still not know what I actually did teach. And so what I'm trying to do with these presentations that we've been doing is to, is to teach what I did teach people um, rather than focusing what I didn't teach them and trying to correct all of these errors that are, that are there present. Does that make sense? Of course. Thank you. No worries. So uh, with regard to memories... Um, the process of memory, remembering, is a very, even for yourselves, is a very emotional process when you think about it, isn't it? There are many memories in your own life that you've forgotten because they're of certain emotional signatures attached to those memories. So f for many people, for example, they have deeply suppressed much of their childhood because of the hurt feelings that they have inside about much of their childhood. And... Um, the process of actually opening towards God is a process of actually opening completely to yourself emotionally as well, which means at some point you will come to remember everything again about your life and you'll deal with the emotion of it as you remember to such a point that you will no longer have an emotion about that memory anymore. So you'll no longer want to suppress the memory. And you'll remember even things like what happened when you were two years of age, three years of age, five years of age, seven years of age, good and bad that, uh, things or damaging things that have happened to you. But not, not only that, you'll also get to remember your own sleep state. In other words, every single night when you go to sleep, you'll have a period, you, you have a period of, let's say it's eight hours that you're asleep, where well, you have a period of eight hours 
that actually you have a life in the spirit world and uh, your body, your, phys- your physical body is left here on the earth and your soul and your spirit body enters the spirit world and you do things all night. And most, for most of us, even that period of our life, we can't remember, right? But you'll also get to a point once you've, once you keep progressing and opening up emotionally, you'll get to a point where you can even remember that as well. So in the end, you'll get to a point where you remember all of your life that you're capable of remembering. Now, obviously, a child at one years of age has very little cognition at a intellectual in an intellectual capacity, because it takes for the brain from one to the age of seven to develop. But from an emotional perspective, that child feels everything. The child is completely feeling right from the moment that it's actually incarnated, from the moment that it's conceived. And so from that moment on, you've got all these feelings, some of which you would prefer to forget and some of which you prefer to remember. In the end, you'll get to a point where you remember everything because there is no preference to forget. And the preference to forget is based on the hurt that we're yet to process emotionally. Now, the reason why I bring that up is that for every one of the 14 that I've mentioned that have returned to Earth, they have to go through that same process of remembering, the process of allowing the emotions, the emotional signatures of each memory. So um, do you mind me mentioning something we were talking about today? Um, Mary was Mary and I were processing emotionally quite a lot today because we were going through memories of our first century event, events in our first century life of what happened and how we felt uh, towards each other but also towards what was going on around us. And we were talking about the events surrounding my death and what the different emotions that Mary was feeling about that now. So she's still having, just like I still have feelings about those events now. And she just, and she was getting into the emotion of remembering all of the different things that happened after my death to her. The different ways in which uh, she was closed down and shut down by the so-called disciples and and what happened with regard to them listening to her and things like that. And there's a whole set of emotions associated with that that we have to go through. And so that's what we're going through. So our process of remembering is the same as your process of remembering. And that is, you have to be open emotionally in order to remember. And so what I'd like to encourage you to do is to open up emotionally to every little bit of childhood terror and pain that has occurred and allow yourself to remember it and process it emotionally, allow yourself to feel it emotionally. And then as you do that, you'll find that you'll become free of it. And as you become free of it, you'll get to the point where you remember everything, but you no longer have any pain about everything that happened. And really that's a part of this process of going, coming towards God, opening to God. Does that help you with the question that you asked? Like, I know it was a long-winded answer, right? <laughs> I always give long-winded answers. And um, down here, we were going to... If you can still remember your question, that is. <laughs> that still work? Yeah, well, I just wanted to know if uh, we're going to do the, 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 the program in uh, Armadale as well, that was all. Um, in terms of the opening to God workshop of Mary's? Yes. How, uh, we'll probably check in Armadale how many people would like to do it. We do it for around about, I think it's about 20 that you normally have, isn't it, in each session. So, so as long as there's around 20 people, we'll go anywhere. <laughs> and there is also at the moment a group of people that Mary is using as assistants who are being taught how to actually run the course as being a part of the assistants. And... Um, and they are, they are in a pretty humble place themselves. They are, they are a pretty open place emotionally. And, uh, and so even if myself and Mary can't do the course, um, eventually these people will probably start doing the course too. And there's about uh, 10 of those who are nearly, there's a couple who are going to get tried for the first time next month. And, uh, and obviously what we want to do is get to the stage where there's lots of people who can help other people. On, on the on the divine love path. So we don't want you to be dependent upon myself and Mary in order to progress. What we want 
in the end is for there to be lots of assistance that's available to you to to progress spiritually and uh, and so for example what we've found is that when there's around about 200 people one person really struggles helping 200 people from an emotional perspective now if you imagine if there's now like 500 people who want to have help then one person or two people are just going to very much struggle with that. But if we've got 40 or 50 or even 100 people who, who are at the space where they can help others, they're very open emotionally, they're very humble, they've already got a good connection with God and all of those kind of things, then obviously we can help a lot more people in that place. And so um, that's really what we're trying to achieve at this point. So we help a group of people who want to be helpers in the end and those help, group of people eventually help others and so forth until you get to a point where there's thousands and thousands of people who are actually on the divine love path progressing towards God. And once we've got thousands who can help others, then tens of thousands can come along. But it's pointless having thousands come along when there's only one helper. So that's that's what we're trying to achieve. Thanks, we, okay. No worries. If we go to Dave and then to the fellow behind you, Dave. Hey Joe, I don't know whether this question's already been asked or not, um, but why did you guys decide to come back? Like in my reading of the Paget messages and uh, the life of Lysian, etc., uh, it, it seems that, that things unfold as they're going to anyway. Like I suppose this question's intellectually, why do you need to come back and hurry things along? Um, well, we're not coming back to hurry things along for a start. Um, the problem is, is that um, in between the time when I was on the first century and now, there has been no one on earth who has been at one with God. And we tried to help lots and lots of people to become at one with God while we were in the spirit world. But in the spirit world, you were severely hampered helping people on earth to become at one with God. And I'll explain why, firstly. Let's imagine that here's the person you would like to assist to become at one with God. Now that person has a whole group of moral issues. In other words, they have a belief system based around morals. For instance, some of them believe that you should only have one husband. Some of them, on the, even on the planet today, believe you're allowed to have five wives, don't they? So that there's all these moral conditions that are very different. Moral also in terms of some people believe it's okay to lie. Some people believe it's okay to steal. Some people believe it's all of those, all of those things are okay. So there's a whole different set of moral conditions in the individual. Then there's a whole set of beliefs in the individual. So the beliefs might be beliefs about God, beliefs about the universe, beliefs about child rearing, beliefs about you know, how we should use our life, beliefs about desire and passion, and all these different belief systems that we have, some of which are harmonious with love and harmonious with the way God created us to be, and some of which are very disharmonious with love and very much, uh, you know, based around fear, if you like. Then we have a whole set inside of this same person, we have a whole set of emotions, and those emotions range from love on one end of the scale right around to the deepest terrors on the other end of the scale. And in between that there's hatred, anger, rage and all these other different emotions all within one individual on the, on the, on the planet. Can you see also that uh, there is all these different beliefs about love which, which we'll call them love beliefs and we'll separate them from normal beliefs. Normal beliefs, let's focus on the beliefs of the universe and life and all those kind of beliefs. But we also have a whole set of love-based beliefs. Like some of us believe that it's loving to help somebody out no matter what they've done. Others believe, no, it's not loving to help a murderer. You know, it just depends, doesn't it? Everyone has a whole different set of belief systems. Now, not only that, on top of this, so this is what's inside the person. On top of that, that person, because of their own law of attraction, has a whole set of spirits that they attract around them, who are around them. They might be male or female spirits, right, who are around them. 
And every one of those spirits around them has a whole set of morals, beliefs, emotions, and all these kind of things, which are influencing this person. And of course, this person also has usually a set of religious beliefs. And I would even classify an atheist as having a religious belief. And that is a religious belief based that they feel there is no God. An agnostic has a religious beliefs. In other words, they feel they don't know how, how anything works. But that's still a belief. Does that make sense that we hold on to? Now, all of these belief systems are present in the person. And then we've got all of these spirits surrounding this individual who are also in the same set or a whole different set of belief systems, but influencing the person. And then there's a person up here who knows the truth. And now there are literally millions and millions of spirits who are above the eighth sphere, so from the eighth sphere and above, or what the Paget messages refer to as the celestial kingdom. They know the truth. and They are trying to influence this person. But can you see it's like trying to influence a person with a heap of truth through a heap of fog, like and a heap of like smoke and, you know, there's all these different things going on for this person and you're trying to give them these truths, but how, how, do, you, how do you do? You can't actually be in their face doing it because at the moment there are some limitations that God's placed on the interaction between humankind and the spirit world. And you can't, uh, so you can't influence them directly by grabbing them by the scruff of the neck and sitting them down in front of you and saying, now hang on a sec, you know that moral, that moral belief you have that you can look at any woman you like as long as you only go to have sex with your wife, that is actually an immoral belief. You know, that's actually out of harmony with love. You can't sort of grab them as a spirit and say that, but here on earth you can. You can actually get an audience together like this if anybody wants to listen to you and you can then say, here's a moral belief that's out of harmony with love. Here, here's one of them. Here's another one of them. Here's another one of them. And it will enter the person's mind, might not enter their heart at the time, of course, but at least it at least enter, enters their intellectual awareness. And what we realised after a while was that most of the problems in the spirit world come from, and in fact actually all of the problems in the spirit world, come from our life here on earth and the choices that we make that are out of harmony with love here on earth. Now as a spirit, when you're looking at all this happening, what you want to do is start addressing the causal emotional reasons why there's all this pain and suffering. But the only way you can do that is by actually starting to address the causal emotional reasons inside of an individual at the time that the causal emotional things are being created. And that happens here on earth. So almost every spirit who's in the seventh sphere or in the eighth sphere or above has this really passionate desire to help any person here on the earth in any way they can. Now, when Myself and Mary arrived in the 22nd sphere condition. For the first time, we realized that we were, that we were now able to return to Earth. Before you get to that condition, you're not able to return to Earth. So before that condition, you feel, in a way, a little frustrated in the sense that you know the causal emotional condition is being created here on Earth because people have walked away from God here on Earth. You know all of these things exist in the person on Earth, but you're really struggling to influence them positively. And on top of that, you have a passionate desire to help them as much as you can. So when you get to the place where you can actually now like conceive what it's like to actually return and per perhaps be able to help people in a totally different way than you have been for 2,000 years, it's a high likelihood you would have taken it as well, the opportunity. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I'm guessing like simple maths, if you can help help one person here on earth, you also affect numerous spirits. Yes. Attached and watching, etc., etc. Exactly. And, and not only that, all it needs in the end is one person here on earth to become at one with God again. That's really all we need. Once we have one person who becomes at one with God on earth, millions of people will notice that, just like people noticed in the first century. Does that make sense? And once you have one, there's a high likelihood of you having two. <laughs> and then having three, and then having four, and then having ten, and then having a hundred, right? But if no one's 
it, like in 2,000 years of experimentation, this is what it was like for us, for 2,000 years of experimentation, we tried to assist people to even listen to the truth, let alone write it down or practice it themselves. And the only person in that 2,000-year period that we ever got to listen to us to an open enough extent to write down a quite a number of truths was James Paget, actually, in that entire period of time. Now, we had other experiments happening all at the same time, and uh, many, many hundreds and thousands of experiments happening all through that historical period, but the only one that in the end was quite successful was that one. But even though that was successful, how many of you had ever heard of James Paget before you met me? Like hardly anyone was there who, who, who would be in that condition. And so, and so can you see how even though the truth was available, there was no one actually living it. And when there's no one living it, then the truth doesn't actually ever get distributed to others. It's only by the power of you living the truth that things actually change. So all of this is essentially driven by your desires to, to bring truth to others. Yeah, and, and my desires, and I've learnt to do this with God, to bring my desires... When, when, um, if I can give you a little bit of background before I say what I was going to say. Um, when you activate your pure desires in a way that's harmonious with love all the time, you at that moment are being what God created you to be. Does that make sense to you? So, so, for example, if you've grown up with music all of your life and then you passionately get into music and you just really sink yourself into it and you're passionate about it, you will become successful with music. People will get to know you. If you have a pure desire with it, you will, people will get to know you and this passionate desire will go through the rest of your life, even after you pass from earth into the spirit world. And the more you bring yourself into harmony with that passionate desire, the more you're being yourself. And so what I learned myself was that as long as I exercise my passionate desire, and my passionate desire has always been to connect firstly to God as like I understood from my own background and my own readings in the first century that, it, that I could actually become at one with God, like being in this unique condition, and that every single person who's ever lived also has the potential of do, being in that condition. And, but I realised that nobody had. And after a while, once I developed that passion and followed that passion to the end, what happened was I realised that passion inside of myself which meant that now all of this truth could come through to me because I'm now at the state where I was at one with God and now all that truth can come through me and be distributed to others. Now many of you will have the same passion in your future. Like many of you already do have a passion for truth. Isn't that not the case? So, so many of you will activate this passion for the truth so much that, that you will so passionately desire the truth in your own life that you'll live it. And when you live it, you will automatically attract everyone around you who wants to listen to the truth, will be drawn to you as a result of you living it. So it's not as a result of you speaking it, it's as a result of you living it emotionally that things change. And once you understand that, you realise that even if you're up here and you're still progressing, you're still living it, so you're still progressing, you get to the point where you now have, see the potential of helping every single person who's ever lived with regard to truth, the majority of you in that position would have taken the same choice that myself and Mary took, I'm sure, right? once you're in that space. Now, one of our emotions that we were going through today was we regret making that decision at times. <laughs> so Mary had quite a long cry today about uh, regretting that decision. Um, but in the end... Um, that's one of the emotions that we just need to work our way through, just like any other emotion, the emotion of having lost what we had. The problem for us is we remember what we had and how that felt, and we feel now like we've lost that. And obviously we haven't lost it, it's just a process of processing through that emotionally to recover it, but we feel we've lost it, so we've got to go through that emotionally. But for the majority of people, if they were in the position where they are at the, you know, the pinnacle, if you like, of your development in love, for the majority of people in that position, if you had the opportunity now to help 
billions of people rather than just a few people, as you had been before, then I'm sure you would take that opportunity. So while I helped millions of people get into the celestial heavens, um, there are still billions of people in the other spheres of the spirit world who are, who are not yet at one with God, who are not yet enjoying the things that I've enjoyed in the, in the past in the spirit world, and, and I would love them to at least have the opportunity to have that experience. Now, when I was in that state and when Mary was in that state, we together can feel God's intention. And what will happen is you, as you progress on the divine love path, you will come more and more to feel God's intention. And you will have a choice to either bring your intention in harmony with God's intention or just to do your own thing. Now, what myself and Mary have chosen is to bring ourselves into harmony with God's intention. And one of God's intentions was for this period of time to be a time of change. So the time that we're living in right now is a critical key time for humanity. It's not what the Christians foretell, and that is, you know, me coming on a cloud with all my army destroying the wicked and setting up a paradisaic conditions on earth, nothing like that. And it's not what other religions foretell in it of cal calamitous events. That, uh, but there are a mixture of things that are going to occur this period of time, and the mixture of things include economic total economic change. Another thing includes total um, upheaval of the earth itself because of the damage that's being done to it from our soul condition, and. And so there's a lot of things that are going to happen over your lifetime if you live over the next few years um, that that will be a part of the changes that need to occur. And what what we are doing with you is a, is a large part of those changes. At the moment, that's not well known, but it will become more and more well known as these changes come onto the planet. So So we could see God's intention and we ourselves had a desire to also be a part of that plan of God, if you like, and because of that chose to return and start this process at this particular period of time. And, and this particular period of time is the best time because this is the period of time for, for multitudes of reasons that humanity is beginning to change. Um, for example... I don't know if you're aware, but scientifically, time and space is compressive. In other words, it can be compressed and it can expand. And what's happening now is a speeding up of time in, a, in an emotional, experiential sense. Now, many of you are starting to realise that in your own life. Decisions that would have taken you 10 years to make before, you're making in a week. You know, how many of you 10 years ago would have easily given up your house to move to another house? But today, many of us moved within one year four or five times, just bang, 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 because it wasn't suitable or whatever. How many of us would have easily moved out of relationships? You look at the previous generation of people, often they had bad relationship, but they never moved out of it their entire life. They stayed in it until they died. Now it's very rare for a person to stay in a relationship that's destructive to them for their entire life because things are speeding up, things are changing. And this is all a part of what God has planned. And while, while God has everything under control and I, I don't have anything under control, I can assist God's plan through my desire or I can try to make it not happen through my desire. Now, obviously, God's God, and if I try to make it not happen through my desire, I really haven't got much chance at all, right? Because I'm really fighting against God. But if I exercise my desire harmonious with love and harmonious with God, I will enjoy the many beautiful things that God gives to those who exercise their desire in harmony with God's laws. And that's what I've personally experienced in my life, and that's one of the things that we wanted to teach as well. So there's a whole multitude of reasons why we've returned. Um, but obviously, and many of them I've yet to explain, um, even though I've spoken for 300 hours to groups of people that are recorded, um, there's still many of those things that I've yet to explain. And of course can't be explained until the people who are listening are ready to hear what needs to be said. 
but that is all the part of what will happen in the future. Mm. If we can go Thanks, behind you to straight up. Um, I got the impression that um, you setting up, or I made a judgment that you setting up a duality between the divine love path and the so-called natural love path. Yep. Um, the truth is actually that the divine love path incorporates the natural love path. So um, if I can just illustrate that, I'm going to need a... It's a bit hard to do things with a mic, can you? So let me illustrate that. There is no problem with displaying natural love. In fact, God designed you to display natural love in order to be happy if you wanted to be happy without God in your life. So in other words, if you wanted to be happy without choosing God-reliance in your life and instead just be completely self-reliant, or you wanted to make up your own rules about God and your own rules about life, if you want to be completely happy, you will have to at some point follow one of the natural love paths. Now, there are literally millions of them because mankind has set up so many millions of ideas and paths as a result. But what happens is if you look at the natural love path, if I can follow it up like so, in terms of its progression, remember we have spheres or dimensions or spaces and on earth we can progress through them just as well as we can in the spirit world. So, see. so there's the, let's say that's the natural love path, that arrow. Now, when I say natural love paths, there are obviously millions of them. Now, as they progress, these paths, they all become refined by the steps of love that you need to be taken. So in the first sphere, for example, there is very little love in the first sphere in terms of what people learn about in the first sphere. And so initially, a lot of our religious beliefs on earth have a lot of death in them, they have a lot of fear in them, they have a lot of beliefs that you can kill other people for the sake of your beliefs in them and things like that. So if you think about it, a lot of the religious beliefs that are on the planet right now, while some of their concepts are highly idealistic, other concepts that those same religions have are very base and fear-based. In other words, they're very debased. Um, you look at the concept that I can kill you if you don't have the religion that I have, for example. That's obviously a very dark place. So it's not very love-based. So as we progress in love on the natural love path, eventually we're going to have to make these steps into new and more loving spaces. And that's beautiful. That's, that's an essential part of our progression as the human race. But we have the option as well of this other path. It's not, not something that is, uh, that is mankind created. It is God created. So, so this, all of these paths are the paths that man has stated. And eventually, the way God's designed her universe, every one of them get refined in love. So a Catholic in the sixth sphere of the spirit world doesn't believe the same things as a Catholic in the, on earth here, here at the moment, right? A Buddhist in the sixth sphere doesn't believe the same thing as a Buddhist here on earth at the moment. A Muslim in the sixth sphere doesn't believe the same thing as a Muslim here on earth. But there are still Muslims and Catholics and and Protestants and, and all sorts of religions in the sixth sphere. All these different ideas, if you like. And the reason why they're all there still is because man in the end created them all. They all came from man. And God refined them by actually saying, you can't progress until you refine this idea. So in other words, until you progress, until you refine the idea that you can kill another person based on your religious belief, you will never get out of the first sphere of the spirit world, ever. Whether you're here on earth or in the spirit world, you'll never get out of it until you refine the belief to a point where you realise, actually, if I loved, I wouldn't want to kill anybody for any reason. And when you get to that point, you've now been refined enough to enter the second sphere. 
and now you'll have refined your beliefs. So anything that was in the Bible before that you read that justified violence, you would now reread and see, oh, well, that must have been another guy who was out of line with truth who wrote that and out of line with love. Can you see that? Now, what God did was God also had this other path, but this other path just keeps going. It's an infinite path. It's infinite because God created it and God herself is infinite. And so if therefore the progressional path that God created that would make sense would also be infinite. And it goes beyond the six-sphere boundary. The reason why there's a boundary here is only because man by himself, without, without doing things God's way, can't progress beyond a certain point. And the reason why is because God created your soul in such a way that your intellect is immaterial to its future development after the sixth sphere of the spirit world. In other words, your soul needs to be developed beyond this point, not your intellect. So you can develop your intellect and develop and change your ideas and change your belief systems and everything using the natural love path. So if we call this the natural love path, this path that man, all these paths that man has created. And by the way, man has created them because man in the end wanted to be self-reliant. So that's the point of it. Can you give, give us a definition of God and soul? Certainly. God is an entity who created you and the universe, and God is the great oversoul of the universe. God is actually someone who you personally can connect to with your soul. And what God did was he created your soul, and your soul is dual in nature in that it splits into halves. In other words, it has a masculine half that splits off and, and usually a feminine half, not always. But the way that a split occurs is is I've described in some other material, which you can listen to. And the split occurs and it splits into two forms, male form generally with two bodies and a female form with two bodies, the bodies being physical and the spiritual bodies. So one half of the soul with the body, two bodies, and the other half of the soul. The soul, the combined soul, is the real you. So you right at the moment are just one half of a soul. And eventually you will meet your soul mate, if you haven't done already, and it, and your entire progression in the future, up until the 22nd dimension of the spirit world, is about you coming to union with your soul mate. And once you get to that state of union, which is way, way above the sixth sphere, on the divine love path, the divine love path is the only way to obtain union. The reason why it's the only way is because scientifically your soul needs to change in order for it to become completely unified. It needs to get out of this intellect-dominated condition that man has established that is actually self-reliant and into a soul-based feeling dominance that we need to develop and grow. And as we do that, we'll draw our soulmate to us. We'll also progress towards God automatically as we do that, as long as we have the desire for God's love to enter us. And God's love enters us and changes. So as we're progressing on this divine love path, which is infinitely progressive, what's happening is we're learning the same things that these men had to learn. Can you see that? We're learning the same lessons that these men had to learn on this natural love path until we go beyond the seventh sphere or the sixth sphere. And from then on, we're learning a whole set of different lessons. That everyone who is intellectually dominant and doesn't want to focus on their soul cannot learn until they become emotional focused. And once they become emotional focused, they then can learn this material from God the same way as these intellectual people learnt the material intellectually but using your soul or using your emotions instead of your intellect to learn. And it's a totally different way of learning. The best way I could describe to you is like this. You, you know sportsmen who play different sports. They're honed to perfection in their sport, right? And a lot of times what they do is they practice and practice and practice and they practice so much that after a while everything just becomes... They, they enter, all of them say they enter this zone where they're no longer even thinking 
about what they're doing anymore. They're just in this zone where everything starts happening automatically. And this is the zone that God actually created us for, for us to live in all the time, this place where everything actually happens automatically, not something that we have to learn and practice and practice and practice and practice until we come to know it. And, and it's only by, do, by progressing on the divine love path that you can actually get to the point where the soul is developed into everything happening automatically. So when you ask me a question, I don't have a thought about it at all. The stuff that comes out of me, the reason why it comes out of me straight away and I don't have to think about it is because I'm feeling about it and the feelings automatically are there as soon as you ask your question. And all I need to do is now say the words that my feelings are generating. Does that make sense? So it's a totally different way of interacting with people even. And so as you progress, you will go beyond this part where man can go. So, so your original question was about duality. Are we creating duality? No, what I'm, crea what I'm saying is the truth, and that is that man has created all these ways that they think are to God, but they all stopped because they were all developed by man's intellect. But God created this other way, which actually is inherently and built in every one of us as a child that we all detune from from a very young age, this other way to connect to God that is infinite in its progression and that once we understand its principles, we can follow permanently all of the rest of our existence and we will progress beyond this point. And once we progress beyond that point, we will look back at that point and see that even the progression on this path wasn't duality. It was all just leading us to this point of making a choice between whether we are God-reliant or whether we're going to remain self-reliant. And that's really the choice in the end. So the natural love path is all about self-reliance. And there are beautiful lessons you have to learn in self-reliance. But the divine love path incorporates all those lessons and in addition to that teaches you God reliance, complete God reliance. Does that sort of help? You can ask more questions. <laughs> If I, if I was to rephrase it, then you could say, yeah, I'll so try and say what I understand. Yeah. What you're saying is that, um, that God exists as an entity. You said that. Yes. And the soul or our supposed work here yep. is about more or less feeling our emotional baggage to move towards God. Yes, but it's not just about feeling your baggage because feeling your baggage ends in the seventh sphere of your dimension of the dimensional existences. In the eighth sphere and thereon, you've got no baggage, but you are still growing in your soul capacity. If you could think of it like a stream of light and energy flowing from God, and this stream of light and energy I call love, so you might, you know, people use the term light and other terms. But actually what it is is God's love. And as this love enters your soul, your soul transforms into a different type of creature. If you could think of it like that, your soul transforming from a standard human soul that God created you to be without God, if that's the way you wanted to exist. And as you long for divine love to enter your soul, your soul is now being transformed into this divine creature, a totally different type of soul. The human soul is is the only thing that is capable of this transformation. And as this transformation occurs, you will become divine in the sense that you will become at one with God in the way God thinks and acts. You won't do what God says because God in that space doesn't tell you to do anything because everything you do will be harmonious with that divine love that you've received. So as you progress through these phases of the negative emotions, you're actually only doing a small portion of what is to be your final destination. Your final destination is going to have many more learning experiences that are not negative in nature, that, that are not to do with negative emotions, but where your belief systems and truths will change very rapidly as you learn and become closer and closer to God. So by the time you get to the seventh sphere of the spirit world, you will have 
refined a lot of the things inside of your soul and you'll not have as many emotional injuries inside of your soul. And when you make the transition into it one moment with God, from that moment on there is no fear in your soul again. From that moment on there's no fear. But there's still lots to learn and there's still like there's a whole universe out there of things to learn and discover. And God is going to continue teaching you because God is infinite. God has the capacity to teach you infinitely. And so as you grow and you grow and you grow and you grow, you are learning more and more and more and more until you get to the point where, and there, there is no point, end point, in the sense that you are you are becoming more like God. And in, in fact, in the first century I said, you will become perfect just as your heavenly Father is perfect. And what I meant by that was when you become at one with God, you will be perfected in love. Everything you automatically do will be loving. Everything. Every action you take, every way you handle, every situation, every person you interact with will all be loving. At the moment it's not because we've got these negative emotions that are boiling inside of us that need to be released and dealt with. But as we release them, we become more loving and our soul expands a little more and a little more and a little more. And as it expands, it eventually becomes God-like. And when we make this transition between the seventh and eighth sphere, we now become God-like. Now, with the natural love path, that is not possible because on the natural love path we are self-reliant, we're not God-reliant. We're not asking or longing for divine love to enter us. We have all these different concepts about God. I know atheists who are in the sixth sphere of the spirit world who, who still do not, do not even believe in God, but they have been refined emotionally to the point where they are beautiful in love, in natural love, but they are never going to transform their soul because they're yet to connect to God. I know Muslims in the sixth sphere of the spirit world. I know Christians in the sixth sphere of the spirit world. New age people who you've met from a from hundred years ago sitting in the spirit world. You know that all these different types of people are all there because they yet to connect to God in this different way that God designed to connect. So it's got nothing to do with me designing it. Nothing to do, all I've done is just discover it, just like, just like the Wright brothers and other people discovered flight, if you like. That's all that, that's all that's happened here. So there's nothing unique in that, in that all through your history, all through humankind's history, there's been people who have discovered things. There was, there was a first person who discovered radiation. There was a first person who discovered, you know, what, what happened, what the temperature was where water turns into ice. You know, there's, there's the first person who discovers everything. And I was just the first person to discover this. That's all. Since then, there's been many millions who have discovered it. So what about the supposed um, Buddhist teachings? What level? I mean, they're throughout, I'm sure. But, I mean, have you experienced their level of connection with God? Okay. Well, for a start, it depends what type of Buddhist you're talking about because there are Buddhists who don't believe in God as an entity and there are Buddhists who do believe in God as an entity. The Buddhists who do believe in God as an entity are capable of progressing further than the Buddhists who don't believe in God as an entity. So straight away there's limitations on, uh, on the belief based on what type of belief they have. But many of the Buddhist beliefs focus very much upon the development of the human form into the divine by its own effort. And what I'm saying to you, that actually you cannot progress beyond the sixth sphere of the spirit world on your own effort. What I'm saying to you is that there is this substance that comes from God, called God's love, that needs to enter your soul before you can make the trans the the, the transitional point above the sixth sphere. So for that reason, there are many a Buddhists who have yet to discover this divine love flowing into their soul in the spirit world. And so those Buddhists, as are there are many Christians and there are many Muslims in the same condition, are still in the sixth sphere of the spirit world. There are others who you have known of, like, for example, Gandhi. Gandhi, went short, shortly after he passed, he knew already that he was on the divine love path before he even passed from earth, even though he had a very Hindu and Buddhist belief system, right? And, and then as he refined it, he found this same path, the same path that every one of us has, are capable of discovering. And as we find, and now he is in the 17th dimension of this, of this spirit world. 
right? And he's made that progression far more rapidly than the majority of people because on earth, on earth, he was a person who had this strong desire for truth, strong desire to be in a state of love. Hello, Gandhi. A strong, he's here right now with us now. He's had, just had this strong, passionate desire to be in a state of truth and a strong, passionate desire to be in a straight, state of love right from the time he was on earth. He learnt about these principles. And as a result of that, he discovered the divine love path. He started transforming his emotions. Now, he had changes to make when, after he passed, but those changes meant that he could progress into the spirit world and beyond the place where most of his contemporaries have stopped their progression. So there are actually people in the spirit world above the eight sphere from every walk of life you can imagine, uh, every, every religion you can imagine. But they've all had to discover this one thing, and that is God's love flowing into their soul and its transformational power. They've had to discover that. And that they've had to discover the principles of how that operates, which are the principles that I'm showing to you, teaching you through all these seminars that we've been doing. And they've had to discover those principles by listening to somebody else in the spirit world generally. They've had to, you know, somebody's come along and said, oh, do you want to know about this other path? What do you mean other path? You know, like surely that, you know, and they come up with the same arguments we come up with on earth oftentimes about, oh, but does that mean that God's got jewel? And, you know, we ask all these intellectual questions and I've been told the same things as what you're getting told and they found this path and progressed on that path in exactly the same manner. Can we have the mic? You wanted to say some things, babe? Oh, I was just going to add a comment about um, the gentleman said, so you're saying we just need to feel our negative emotions on this path. And for me, this path is actually more about um, activating my desire, mm -hmm. my desire to be loving, to connect to God, to... Um, grow in truth mm. and I feel my negative emotions are the things that prevent that so then as a result I process my emotions yeah yeah so yeah. processing emotions is really a effect of yeah. wanting to get closer to God if you like it's not the basis for it all um, and it's not the basis of the teaching even no it's not even the basis of the teaching either and it's very important to understand that Remember I said this man, when I drew the man down here, that he had belief systems, morals and emotions and other things? All of these things have to change if we want to bring ourselves into line and harmony with God's truth. We need to change our truth to suit God's truth. So it's not just our emotions that need to change. Does that make sense? Really, so, really it's the core, the core of getting to... Uh, that connection with God and soul is about working through, you know, the desires and all those things that you that you listed previously mm -hmm. through the emotional, um, through the emotion, isn't it? Um, well, the, the problem is that many of our emotions can be very distorted, as you probably already know. Like, for example, many of us may, like, you see a little child having a lolly taken away from it, what does it normally do? So it's half eating a lolly, like it's half eating this lolly, and you come along and grab the lolly out of its mouth and take it away. What does the child normally do? Scream, doesn't it? Like, just have a tantrum. In that moment, is the child loving? No, it's not. You see, it's the reason why it's not loving is because it's got an expectation and a demand, and the child at that moment isn't loving. That because when you are in a state of pure love, you will not have an expectation or a demand coming out of you ever again. So the child itself in that state is not actually loving while it's having its tantrum. But it is emotional. Can you see that just because we're in an emotion, it doesn't mean that we've learnt how to love yet. Because many of our emotions can be rage. I could be in a rage and I could be saying, I'm emotional, I'm on the path. But I'm not on the path because I'm, this is a path about love, not a path about just emotions. Now, love is an emotion, so therefore it's going to incorporate my emotions. But, but it's about my desire to develop in love and my desire to get close to God and close to myself and my soulmate and to live in a state of love permanently without effort. That's what the path's really about. Can we wait? can we use a microphone because nothing gets recorded? Um, 
So does that make sense? So, so there is, there is an emotional part of the path, certainly, but it's certainly not all of the path because there's so many things we need to learn besides living in an emotion, if that makes sense to you. Can we come? Um, just listening to what you're saying there is just say tomorrow, not that I'm putting it out there, yep. but if I woke up, uh, I was loving, hopped in my vehicle, drove down the highway, a dog ran out in the highway, I swerved, hit another car, killed a person in that car. Yep. How do I know that's not divine love? Um, well, in, in action. Well, okay. A lot of times on the natural love path, we start telling ourselves things to actually get away from our emotions. So, so in that situation, what we, what we, we, we've driven across the, you know, swerved to miss the dog, hit another car, killed a person. What emotion do you think I might be feeling? I'm talking about not having those thoughts of doing that, not having any anger while I'm driving down the road, just being in pure love, and yeah. that event happens. Well, well I'm, what I'm, I'm saying is, good about it. what I'm saying is that event won't happen when you're in a state of pure love. That's what I'm saying, and I'll give you a reason why. These events all occur to trigger us emotionally to bring us closer to God in some way. Now, every single law of attraction event that occurs, many of which, by the way, if you look at your life, are quite sad, hurtful, painful, are they not? Well, all of these law of attraction events are caused by something inside of our own soul and inside of the soul of others whom we're interacting with. So, in the example you've given, there was something inside of the soul of that person who got killed in this accident that generated this accident. And there's something inside of your soul that got that generated. Now, maybe it was a feeling of guilt from your childhood about something that you hadn't yet dealt with, right? And you're driving along the road and you need a really, you've had lots and lots of triggers over your life to deal with that emotion, but none of those triggers have ever caused you to deal with the emotion. And so what happens is the law of attraction brings more and more extreme events to us in order to help us to get closer to this emotion. Now, this event is a combination of all of the unloving emotions in every person involved in the event, not just you, right? So it's all of the emotions in every single person involved in the event that create the event. And the event is created so that every single one of those persons involved in the event finish up dealing with the group of emotions that created the event. But that sounds divine love in action to that bring is, you to that lesson. That so, is divine love in action. Yeah. God's love is always in action, right? But it doesn't mean that I'm in harmony with that love when I, when I run over a person. But you're playing your part perfectly in order for that experience to happen unconsciously being followed by divine love. Well, that is true. Like you're playing your part in terms of... But you can now choose to hold on to that emotion or release the emotion that generated the accident. Agreed? Now, if you chose in that moment to not deal with the emotion that the accident created inside of you, can you now be said to be in harmony with divine love? Yes, if you follow that principle of, of dealing with the feelings, the emotions. And so as long as I deal with the feelings and emotions and I work through all of those, I am still allowing this whole action to trigger me emotionally and now I'm still acting in harmony with the love that's there. But what I'm saying is when you're at one with God, that event wouldn't even occur. Does that make sense? And the reason why that event, it wouldn't occur to you because you're at one with God. And, as you, and when you're at one with God, there are no emotions inside of you that create negative events. So therefore, the, the, the event wouldn't even happen to you. you. You may do things that you choose to have happen to you when you're at one with God that other people perceive as negative. For example, in the first century, I chose the process that led to my death, right? That doesn't, doesn't mean that I chose death. I actually chose the process. In other words, what I did was I chose to live in harmony with truth at every single moment, and I knew that at some point in the future that would bring me into conflict with the people who were around me who didn't want the truth. And eventually it would bring me into conflict with, with the people who were the rulers who didn't want the truth. And their result, the result of their 
they had a choice at that moment. They could choose to listen to the truths that they were being taught by God or they could choose to reject them. Now, they all chose to reject them and the result was my death. But I did not feel that to be a negative event. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because I knew the truth myself and that was there was no such thing as death. And no matter what, and I, there was no painful pain for me in that death, aside from the pain that I could feel my soulmate was experiencing. Does that and, make sense? Yeah, and I, I just use that as an example to yeah. get across. The- so, so while you can intellectually say yes that every event is divine, in that every event that ever happens to us is created by God's laws, which are all divine. This, our response to that is the thing that matters. And for many of us, our response to the divine law is is not a divine act. In other words, we shut down ourselves emotionally. We shut down other people emotionally. We attack other people. We get angry. We get all these different things. And all of those different things are not a person who's in a state of being divine. They are all things that are injuries within us that we need to release. Does that make sense? So... So when you think about it intellectually, there is a danger of ignoring the emotion. And my, my suggestion is don't ignore the emotion just because that is an intellectual truth. So even though that is a truth, that yes, every act that ever happens is a divine act in the sense that God's laws created it, that is certainly a truth. So therefore, every act that ever happens has love based around it because every one of God's laws is loving. But that doesn't mean that our response to every one of those events is loving because that depends very much upon what emotions I have and what beliefs I have inside of me that are harmonious with love as to how how much harmony there is in my own action. Yep. Yep. Let me go straight back. Oh, sorry. You. Me? Well, you're okay. taking the microphone. Okay, thank you. But can I just stop you, because there's a man back here who's had his hand up for quite some time, and I'll, and I'll bring the microphone back down. Thank you. Um, you talk about reincarnation as being a rare, very rare event. Yep. Um, and so that we all have an individual life on Earth here, and we all have very, very different individual lives. Yes. Singular lives. We we start from different points, very, very different points, and have very different opportunities. Yep. To learn on this path. Yep. It seems a very unfair deal if you only get one shot at it, yep. um, and that, and you start from a from a quite disadvantaged perspective from somebody else. Yep. Would you like to speak to that, please? Sure, sure. Can you just turn off that mic because it's just reflecting on that speaker? No worries. That's a very good question. First thing to understand um, with regard to all of our progression. is that success is not measured by our life here on earth. You see, here on earth we have a very finite way of thinking about things. And one of the things that we often think about is that we think, well, I want another go at it because my last time at it wasn't that good. You know, that's, that's often a feeling that we might have. But God has created a linear life for you a life where you can continue to progress throughout your existence and there are far better places to live than here on earth. So, so when, we go, when we start from the premise that we want another turnaround here on earth, we're starting from a premise that actually God has been quite limited in what she has created. And the truth is that God is unlimited in what she's created. What she's created is many different places where you can live not just here on earth. Every single one of the places I've seen that are not here on earth are better than the one on earth. So you see, for many of us, we've lived on earth and we think, oh, you know, this hasn't been a very happy life for me, so we want another go at it, when actually we'd be far better off going to the spirit world and having another bite at what's available there. Does that make sense? And there are far more things and far more powerful things available there to us than even that are available on earth. And the reason why is because as we develop, you know, as we develop in love, so if you can think of all these spheres that I draw, our development in love, right, and so forth, remember it's infinite, 
Um, every sphere is a development in love and is also a different dimension. Can you imagine what the second dimension must be like? If the first dimension is like our dimension here, where, where we've got a lot of unloving things happening and some loving things happening, imagine the second dimension must be have more loving things happening and less unloving things happening. The third dimension must have more and more loving things happening again and a far less unloving things happening again and so forth as you progress in these, in this manner. Now, on earth, we come, we start at, we start at the premise that, oh, I want another shot of earth, but why do you want another shot? of a life that's already at this dimension that's going to have a lot of unloving things happen the next time you come around. And the reason why is because we're still quite limited on earth as to what is available in the spirit world. And the whole reincarnation philosophy began with this limitation. So if you can think thousands and thousands of years ago when reincarnation principles were first come up with, the very first basic rudimentary principle was this. I breathe my last, last breath, and in my breath is my soul. And as I breathe out my last breath, a newborn child breathes in this breath, and in other words, breathes in my soul. And that was the idea that they had, that my life lived on in another generation. And there are lots of reasons why they believed that, because they could see... Unbeknown to themselves, there was a lot of spirit influence occurring. You see, what happens a lot is, let's say we've got a new child being born, its grandparent in the spirit world gets a connection with that child and now heavily influences the child in its emotional and, and belief systems from the spirit world. And so the child growing up, uh, the parents are looking at the child going, mm, boy, he does a lot of things like granddad used to do, right? thinking that he now must be the reincarnation of granddad, when in reality all it is is granddad in the spirit world influencing the child because granddad loves the, his child, his generation, his progeny, and so he's, in, he's actually influencing them. So if we can firstly not continue with this idea that the earth is the be-all and end-all of our life, if we can start opening up to the idea that actually our life only needs to begin here on earth and our life in the spirit world and I can guarantee to all of you that when you pass in the spirit world even your emotions will be more sensitive than your emotions currently are. Not only that, you will see colour more sensitively you see a wider spectrum of colour with your spirit body's eyes than you see with your material body's eyes. You will also not need to feed yourself all the time. So how much of your life is spent cooking and cleaning up after your cooking? Like quite a lot, right? Get rid of all of that out of your life. Imagine that for a moment. Now, for, for many of us, our whole worry about security is based around food, isn't it? Like... If I don't have enough money, I won't have enough food. If I don't have enough food, I'm going to die. So I worry about all that. Now, imagine all of those worries are gone. Well, that's now we're, now we're approximating what it's life in the first sphere. Right? Now, that sounds, doesn't it, like a better place than here already in, the, in that regard. It gives you more flexibility, more freedom. more. Now, imagine for a moment, too, that you could actually instantly transport yourself from one location to another location using this soul and spirit body that you have. Well, you can do that in the first sphere too. So now you've got all these different capacities. Would you like to give them all up and come back to Earth again? Now, the majority of them don't want to do that. But there are many who do, who are in very dark places, who don't have those capacities because they've not yet learned them. And so they have limitations in them as to what they can do. And so they want to come back. And much of the desire to come back is generated by those people. So that's the first comment I'd like to make. If we can just expand our ideas and our horizons to the fact that actually progression in the spirit world is actually more beautiful than here and it also has infinite, it's infinite in its nature. In other words, you can, you can progress without returning back to here. So then the question would become, well, why would you want to return back to here? 
Well, there's not many reasons, really. One might be that you were aborted on earth and you missed out on life here altogether, maybe. That might be a reason. But aside from that, if you've lived a 60, 50, 60, 70 year old life here on earth, many of us have had a lot of pain and suffering during that period of time on earth. A lot of times as a result of this intermingled law of attractions from all sorts of people coming to a land or a country that's quite damaged. For instance, many people on the planet Offaly obviously get born into a country that there's not even enough food to feed them, for example. Now, so the second part of the question, we've got to look at why that has happened. Now, why that has happened is completely the creation of mankind. God has actually created a world that is capable of sustaining billions and billions and billions of people. In fact, there's been different studies done that they feel that mankind, the earth itself could sustain in a, in a environmentally friendly manner, the earth could sustain 60 billion people. Right? However, why can't the earth sustain that amount of people now? Well, if we look at what's happening from mankind's perspective, we can see very clearly why that's the case. And that is that we've got countries like Australia, the USA, Western-based countries, where we take up huge amounts of resources of the earth. Now, there was a study recently done a few years ago, I don't know if you, I think it was on ABC or SBS or something like that, where they actually interviewed an American, an, an average American couple without children. And they studied all of the energy needs and requirements of this couple. And what they found was that if everybody on the planet lived like that couple lived, we would need four more planets of resources just to survive. So in other words, how the average person in the Western world lives is totally not sustainable. Now, because it's not sustainable, what happens? What happens is... We get a group of, we get power plays starting to occur where people want more and they have to take from somebody to have their more. And so what do they do? They take from the people they have power over, which are generally the people who have less in the beginning. And so what we get, instead of having a system on earth that's based around love and sustainability, what we get instead is a system that's totally based around our own humanity, emotional injuries. So the problem is now, after thousands of years living this way, we and people in Ethiopia and people in India and people in Russia and people in every other country of this planet get born into a system that is flawed right at its core. And the core flaw is greed. The core flaw is we don't want to bring ourselves to living in harmony with all of God's laws. What we want to do is I want to have more than you and you want to have more than them, and you know what I mean? And, and these desires which are actually coming from us inside of us emotionally are so powerful that they create so much inequity on the planet and so much of the problems on the planet. So when a person is incarnated the first time, they now no longer incarnate into an equitable location. They now incarnate into a place that's really potluck, whether you're going to be in a, you know, whether you're going to be the richest person on the planet or whether you're going to be the poorest person and die by the time you're five. Yes, unfortunately, but that is man's creation because man can also create the opposite. We can. We can create a system where actually it's equitable for every single person on this planet in the way in which they incarnate. So that the next generation or the next generation after that, when they all incarnate, they all have enough to eat. When they all incarnate, they all have enough opportunity, the same opportunities that they could follow their desires in the same manner. We can create that. You and I can create that. And to be frank, like many people believe they can create it. I don't believe it's able to be created without God being involved in the process. But many people believe that you don't need God in that process to create that. And they're right too. There are many people in the sixth sphere of the spirit world who live permanently in that state and they don't have God in their lives. So we are capable as humanity to create a totally different environment even without God in the process. The problem is, do we want to? The average person, and we've got to be honest with ourselves, 
how many of you would be willing to give up your house in order to create that world? Or your car in order to create that world? Or your bank account in order to create that world? Or your whole idea that Australia is for Australians to create that world? How many of us would be willing to give up all of that? Now, the persons who are willing to give up all of that are the most loving already on the planet. And the people who are not willing to give up that need to make lots of changes. But the only way the changes will be made is at the soul level, in my belief system and in my belief structure. So in the end, I, that's why I've devoted my life to teaching about the truth about the soul, because it's the soul that's going to change things. So when we look at reincarnation, you can see that actually the inequity of people's incarnation is actually based around mankind's creation not around God's creation. God actually created this equitable system where all of us have the same opportunities. And what mankind has done is grabbed that system through self-reliance and turned it into this ugly thing we see before us. That's what man has done. And as such, it is man's responsibility to turn it back into this other place, not God's. Now, God has been waiting for man to do this for many generations and part of the changes that are coming up in this generation that's happening right around us right now is an awareness of this change. And there are many people on the planet now, when you think about it, who are starting to become aware that we need to make these changes. Does that make sense?